Yeah, this is what I want to talk about. If, uh, if you work on foreign policy or national security as I do, uh, this has been a rather, and I'm a former diplomat, so let me use a diplomatic adjective, challenging time. Um, because one of our candidates, candidate Trump and now our president, has said some incredibly unorthodox things about how we should conduct ourselves ac ac across the globe, about China, about Mexico, about our allies in Europe, about our allies in Asia. Uh, and he pretty much says them on a repeated basis uh, 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 through Twitter or other places. But nothing is more mysterious than this odd relationship between Trump and Putin. Um, uh, it it go, cuts against the grain of, if, if you're a Republican, everything that Trump has said as a campaign, uh, uh, as a candidate, and most certainly still as a president, is against everything re Republicans have believed, let alone Democrats. So I think it demands some explanation. So I want to answer, before lunch, three big questions. First, why does Putin like Trump? Second, why does Trump like Putin? And third, will it change our policy between these two countries? So first, why does Putin like Trump? It's pretty simple. <laughs> it's actually pretty simple. Uh, Trump supports Putin and his policies. So why wouldn't Vladimir Putin support uh, candidate Trump and now President Trump. On the campaign trail, uh, candidate Trump has said that he would lift sanctions on Russia. Uh, these were sanctions put in place after Russia annexed territory in Ukraine, uh, Crimea, and then doubled down and invaded Eastern Ukraine. They were put in for a reason, in my view, and they should only be lifted if Russia changes its behavior, and yet, candidate Trump has said he would look into doing that. Second, he said, uh, when asked as a candidate, that he would look into recognizing Crimea, territory that was annexed by Russia, first time that territory has been annexed in Europe since 1945. Uh, he would look into that, music to Putin's ears. Third, he said NATO is obsolete. What could be better if you're Vladimir Putin than to hear an American say that NATO is obsolete? Uh, fourth, check it out. Maybe I'm wrong about this. Follow me on Twitter, at McFall, and, and, and uh, text me today. But I've never heard the president talk about democracy or human rights and advocating for it. Music to Vladimir Putin's ears. He hates it when Americans talk about that. And for me, most offensively, was when on Morning Joe in December 2015, you know, it's a kind of chatty show. I'm on from time to time. I work for NBC. And uh, so you can get, you, your guard can get down for a while. Maybe, maybe you didn't really mean what you said. But Joe Scarborough asked him about Putin and about the killing of some of the, th the people that have been killed. Joe kind of exaggerated, by the way. Uh, but instead of saying that's bad, Vladimir, uh, uh, candidate Trump said, well, we do a lot of killing people. We do a lot of killing too. Somehow equating what we do abroad, what our soldiers do abroad, with what Vladimir Putin does. So if you're sitting in the Kremlin, why these are all very obvious reasons why you would like candidate Trump and President Trump. You don't need a PhD in international relations to figure that out. He goes on and on. This is now uh, after he was elected. He still praises uh, 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 Vladimir Putin. That's, that's nice because Vladimir Putin doesn't get a lot of praise from American presidents. This support for Putin, uh, uh, this support for Trump, excuse me, is within society as well. Uh, societal elements support him. Civil society people support him. And I just want to remind you that um, these positions from Donald Trump are antithetical to traditions in the Republican Party. That's why Putin likes Trump. It goes further than that, so I'm going to just tell you about it, which is he didn't just like uh, Trump. He helped Trump get elected. The Russian government and their uh, entities stole data from Americans, published that data in a way to try to help Trump win and Clinton lose. They also ran ads. They also were on the Internet. They also sponsored um, bots. Uh, these are machine bots uh, that, that had uh, played a role in influence the way that we talked about our election. And I want to make sure you understand this. We were attacked last year. Our sovereignty 
was violated when we were trying to do one of our most sacred things that we do, choose our own leaders. So not only did Putin support Trump and his ideas, he also so tried to do something about it. There's a second reason why Putin likes Trump. He's the opposite of my former boss, Secretary Clinton. Um, all of those things I just described for you are things that she did not support. She doesn't support the recognition of Crimea. She doesn't support the lifting of sanctions. She talks about democracy. And in particular, she talked about democracy at a time when it really upset Vladimir Putin. There was an election in December 2011 in Russia, a parliamentary election. Um, by our views in the US government, I was working at the White House at the time, uh, was falsified at kind of the normal rates. Normal rates, kind of a weird word to use for falsification. But Russian elections, four or five percent, no big deal, at least in our view. But when we saw it, Secretary Clinton criticized it. That's what we do. That was our policy. We talked about these things. And in Putin's view, she sent a signal to spark the demonstrators to protest against him. And that's what they did. Not because of Clinton, let's be clear of that, but they went out, first 5,000, then 10,000, then 50,000, then 200,000 people were out on the streets of Moscow protesting against Vladimir Putin, and he blamed us for it. He said these people were taking their orders from Americans, they were taking their orders from the White House, they were taking their orders from the Secretary of State, and they were taking their orders from us to foment revolution against his regime. And eventually, they said they were taking orders from me personally as the ambassador. <laughs> this, this green man up here, you, uh, is, his name's Alexei Navalny. He is the mastermind of these protests. He was the leader of these protests in 2011. This just happened to him out in Siberia when he was uh, campaigning. Uh, a bunch of people threw some green stuff on him and he just decided to wear it for the rest of the day. Um, but this became a tension. In fact, this was when things got really tense between the United States and Russia, the end of the reset that we had tried to do before, and they started to blame us. In fact, I became the poster child uh, for this campaign as ambassador where I was blamed I was the one that was responsible, sent by Barack Obama to foment revolution against Vladimir Putin. He didn't, so he took it very seriously. So one, he likes Trump because of his policies, and two, he didn't like Secretary Clinton. But there's a third reason why he likes Trump, and why they supported Trump, and why they intervened in our elections uh, last year. Because they believe that Donald Trump, President Trump, will make us divided. We'll be polarized, we'll be fighting against each other. Guess what, they're exactly right. That's exactly what's happening. And that means we're not talking about Crimea. We're not talking about democracy and human rights in Russia. We're not even talking that much about Syria and what Russia is doing there. We're pulling back and fighting amongst ourselves. That is exactly what Vladimir Putin wants. Why does Trump like Putin? Second question. Three different theories are kind of kicking around there. Let me go through them in turn. Let me take the middle one first, blackmail. So there's an argument out there that the Russians have compromising material on our president uh, from visits he made there. I'm sure you've read about it. Uh, and that business associates, including some in the family, also have done some deals with the Russians. Uh, and therefore, they, ha they have leverage on the Trump administration. They can blackmail them to do things. Now, let me be clear. I don't know exactly what Donald Trump did in Russia in the year 2013. I was the ambassador when he came. Uh, we thought about hosting him, and uh, we, we decided that was not a good idea, given why he was there. But let me just tell you, uh, without talking about things I'm not allowed to, uh, if you go to Russia and you stay in a fancy hotel built in the last 15 years, uh, you should assume that every phone call you make, every email you send, every motion you do, and every conversation you have can be monitored by the Russians. They have tremendous capacity, tremendous capacity to monitor what you do. Moreover, I'm sure that there is more to the story about business deals between uh, the, the Trump associates 
and, and Russians, and maybe some of that might even lead to charges of money laundering. But I don't think that's the explanation for why Trump likes Putin so much, because I can't figure out where that deal happens, right? That, that may happen on House of Cards or, uh, you know, another television show where, you know, I will send, I'll, I'll expose this information about you unless you recognize Crimea. And then somebody says, okay, you got me, I got to do that. But that's not how diplomacy really works. I don't know where that deal happens. So I don't think that's the explanation. Second, support during the campaign. Obviously, there was that support. Not yet, obviously, there may have been collusion between some people that were close to Trump and not. And that's why we need it to be investigated. I myself support a bipartisan independent commission like we had after September 11th, uh, but we most certainly have to keep the pressure on our members of Congress and on the executive branch to get to the bottom of it. We still don't know the whole story. My own guess is that there were some people that, that said things that they probably shouldn't have said, and they most certainly had not, did not have the authority to deliver in terms of these quid pro quos. But again, I don't think it's the explanation for the simple fact, for two reasons. One, Trump was saying all these positive things well before the Russians intervened in our election. And two, um, I, I'm just not sure that some of these people that, that were saying these things had that kind of relationship with the president. But I want to know more, and you should want to know more. We can't just move on and say, well, let's just forget about it. The election's over. The election is over, but we have to know what the Russians did and what the Americans, who may have colluded with them, what they may have done, for one simple reason. Like, we, gotta, we don't want to do this again, folks. We don't want to have that same replay uh, of what happened in terms of the violations of our sovereignty. So far, the executive branch and the U.S. Congress has not done one thing to better protect your vote today uh, than what happened in the last election. That is a shame, and it won't change unless you keep the pressure on them, okay? All right, third one, ideological alliance. It is most certainly true that those that think about ideology, people like Steve Bannon, uh, have an affinity and share some ideological norms with people like Putin and Le Pen and the populist, nationalist, anti-internationalist, anti-liberal movement that is now sweeping Europe and most certainly is part of what happened in our country with the election of Donald Trump. And I think of the three that this one is probably the best explainer for why Trump likes Putin, because they're, they're alike ideologically. However, I'm not so sure that, that President Trump thinks that much about ideology, uh, thinks that much about grand scale, grand strategy in the world. And that leads me to the fourth one, is that Putin likes Trump, period. It's your crazy uncle at Thanksgiving explanation for a lot of the things that he does. He just likes him. He thinks he's a strong leader, uh, no ulterior motives. He just thinks he's a good leader. He wants to be like him. And it's just that simple. What does that mean for our foreign policy? Will that mean a new rapprochement, a new relationship uh, with Russia as a result of this uh, nice things that these two people have said about each other? There are some factors in favor and some against. Without question, the central driver of conflict between the United States and Russia when I was in the government was our disagreement about revolutions in Egypt, in Syria, uh, in Ukraine, and eventually in Russia where they blamed us for people going out onto the streets. And we tried to tell them, Barack Obama tried to tell Putin directly, yes, I was there many times and I listened to it, that's not us. People actually do things on their own. They don't need the CIA to tell them what to do. They actually go out and protest. We were reacting to them just like you were. And we could never come to an agreement on that. Putin always thought that it was a hidden hand behind it, and that was us, with your taxpayer money and, and people like me doing it. Not true. But that drama is now over. We're not, we're not arguing about that anymore. Uh, and so that creates an opportunity. We're not arguing about it anymore in the Middle East, Ukraine, or even Russia. All those democratic movements are weaker today than they were back when I was in the government. And so the central conflict is gone. That creates a permissive condition for breakthrough. Second, I already talked about Trump's worldview, that he thinks if we could just get along with Russia, we could uh, you know, fight terrorism. Uh, that creates an opportunity for Putin. And most certainly, 
Putin has things on his agenda that he wants delivered from President Trump today. He wants those sanctions lifted. He wants to see NATO in disarray. And in his dream of dreams, he would love if the President of the United States would recognize Crimea as part of Russia. So um, he's going to hang in there for a while to try to make that happen. I think it would be a mistake, and I want to leave you with some good news about the factors that are against it. First, the common agenda between our countries right now, tragically in my view, uh, is small. Back in the beginning of the Obama administration, we, had a, we actually did some really big deals, right? You know, like the president likes to talk about, we did some big things. We, we signed a treaty to reduce uh, nuclear weapons in the world by 30%. You know, that's what I did in 2010. What did you do? Uh, that's a big deal. Uh, we got sanctions on Iran. We, we built supply routes to Afghanistan through Russia. We were our allies in the fight against Taliban back in 2009, 2010. All of that uh, a common agenda is now gone. The one that President uh, Trump likes to talk about a lot is fighting terrorism. I'm all for fighting terrorism with anybody that we can do it with. But I'll just remind you, with the Russians, that's a little difficult. One, they define terrorism in a lot bigger way, uh, a broader way than we do. They call people terrorists that we call freedom fighters. That's a problem. Two, they fight terrorists in a different way. Uh, we try to not bomb uh, and kill civilians. They wiped out Aleppo, smashed it to smithereens. That's how they fight terrorism. Do we really want to be a part of that? By the way, allied with Hezbollah and Mr. Assad and Iran in doing so, I don't think that's a very good deal for America. Um, and then third, with respect to ISIS, just so you know, we're fighting ISIS. It's called Operation Inherent Resolve. We've been fighting them since 2014, and Putin loves to just watch, sit back and watch us do the fighting. Why get involved in it when the Americans and their allies are already doing it? So I actually think the common agenda is pretty small. Two, uh, I'm not a big fan of Donald Trump. Uh, you may have figured that out by now. Um, uh, I try to be respectful and I try to engage when I can. I am impressed with some of the people that he's hired in his team, including the Secretary of Defense, including the National Security Advisor, people that I know well, and I think they're having a moderating, positive influence on Trump across the board and most certainly uh, with respect to Russia. Three, because of the Russian investigations and the president's current domestic failures, uh, he's got to make a decision. Does he really want to invest his d diminishing capital, political capital, on a breakthrough with Russia? My answer to that is probably not. He's got other bigger agenda items that he has not succeeded doing. When everybody is against him, including most of the people in his party, uh, about some new uh, detente with Russia, do you really want to waste what you have left on that? My guess is not. And then the final one, second here, is I'm not sure Putin wants it. He wanted Trump to get elected. He, he's, got his, he's got his laundry list of things he wants to get from the president. But at the end of the day, Putin called us the enemy as a way to justify his breakdown on all those people uh, protesting that I showed you earlier. He needs us as an enemy to keep that, that story alive. So I don't think it's likely, except for one wild card. Donald Trump. If you don't have a view about the world, if you didn't, you know, you haven't, you haven't taken International Relations 101 here at Stanford, uh, you haven't learned about the way of the world, that means uh, the, the, the switch can go on and off in a very quick way. Uh, and therefore, that makes me uh, unable to predict for you where U.S.-Russian relations are going because of the er erratic nature of our president. Thank you.